for coming. My name is Rodia. I work at KS Wild, and we partnered with uh, REI to bring you um, this talk today. Uh, we have one more talk in the series coming up in August, so make sure to check that out as well. Um, I would just like to start to acknowledge that we are standing on the unceded territories of the Shasta and Tehoma tribes, and to welcome Mr. Uh, Dr. Chris Dunn is a research associate in the College of Forest forestry at Oregon State University. He spent eight years in fire suppression and fuels management prior to pursuing research on contemporary fire ethics, uh, effects and ecosystem response to mixed severity fires. Today, his research focuses on the safety and effectiveness of large fire management through collaborations with the Wildfire Risk Management Science Team of the Human Dimensions Program at the Rocky Mountain Research Station. This allows him to leverage his operational <laughs> experience in research training to bridge the gap between science and management in an effort to better prepare land and fire managers for the changing fire environment. So, thanks Chris. And that's all the time we have. That's all the time I gotta shorten it, that's terrible. <laughs> well, thanks everybody um, for sharing your date nights with me. It's nice to see you here. I'm gonna probably fall, so I apologize if I land on you. <laughs> What's that? I will. I will. I'm just I'm just playing and looking around, trying to figure out how I'm gonna sort of move around up here and not be too much in your way. So thank you, everybody. Really, thank you, and thanks, KS Wild and REI for having me up here. Um, a little bit of this, at least this intro, is really to. I really want to let you know that. You know, human relationships with fire have as much to do with the change that we've seen on the landscape and the things we're experiencing today as the physical environment and climate change does, right? And I often start saying that we're stuck between these really two fundamentally different paradigms. And that is one that was here, as um, Brodia mentioned, you know, by the Tekelma and other tribes that were here present before us and how they interacted with fire and how fire interacted with the landscape right and they had a fundamentally different relationship than we did and certainly what we have pursued since and this is an image from 1953 so following of course world war ii and following the korean war we had all these new toys right that developed and those were then deployed to fight fire to to great success for a while um, although they were aided by humans but as that suppression paradigm sort of set in, it wasn't without controversy. And this is really back to the time when the Forest Service was really being established. So the Forest Service as an entity was established in 1905. The Forest Reserves, the national forests we have now, were largely established in eight, beginning in 1891 and expanded over the years, particularly through uh, with Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot. Um, and they leveraged the big burn of 1910 to great political success to really bolster funding for the Forest Service that was lacking by Congress because they weren't accepting of the public lands existence at the time. Not much unlike the debates we see today, but at the time this was even about just getting the Forest Service to be a functioning organization. And they leveraged that 1910 and we went down the suppression paradigm. And that was that, you know, it was controversial at the time to suppress fires. And I put these up because I like to remember back that the timber industry at the time was advocating for fire. We need fire in the dry forest, and you can see that on the time, to protect our timber resources in the more moist forest where they were more productive, right? So they were actually advocating for continuation of the light burning practices at the time that the Native Americans had employed across the landscape. Uh, of course, the, the federal government at the time pushed back, and we went down the road of suppression that we're um, sort of we're trying to rethink today, right? We're seeing a lot of change on the landscape. We're seeing smoky days like we have today, or smoky summers like we've experienced for the last couple of years. Um, and ultimately, you know, by 1920, we were really settling, and there was a light burn committee that had been established, and they were really critically looking at the, the, the differences between light burning and, and suppression and those potential consequences. 
Um, but by 1920, the chief of the Forest Service, the Forest Service went, we need to expand our timber base. And this all comes on the heels of an expected timber famine because of the overlogging that happened in the late states in the late uh, 1800s, right? So there was this real perception of a timber famine. To build our nation, we were gonna be without wood if we continued the practices of converting timber resources into agriculture lands, which is what they were doing in the late states. Um, so, you know, they, they had an impetus and it, it was logical to pursue that in a policy at that time if that is your worldview and perspectives. And of course, we've learned a lot since. So on came the exclusion paradigm. And it wasn't long after this 1910, 1920s that we started seeing change. And we started seeing change because of fire suppression, exacerbated by our use of some of those wood materials and high grading at the time. Um, and so when they were pulling out individual large trees, that further compounded the effects of fire suppression and really densified many forests. These are only the dry forests. Not all forests experienced this and experienced some uh, grand change because there are plenty of forests that did not burn recurrently at those 10, 20 year intervals. Um, but many of the dry forests did. Um, and we saw a great change. And those were recognized as early as the 40s here even in Oregon. Um, and we're still trying to, to, to unravel and deal with that. Uh, today. And that, of course, wasn't the only change that we started seeing across the landscapes. There were massive modifications to the lands. Um, in this case, what we're fo I'm, I'm focusing on is through timber management. <coughs> right? And so here we are in the Klamath ecoregions over here. And here's an image actually post Douglas Complex fire. But you can see the fragmented landscapes that we have created, particularly through what we call the O and C lands that we have down here in Medford and on up through Roseburg, or at least for the dry portion, and it, it does extend all the way up into Northern Oregon. And then there are other states that experience something similar. And so this became uh, a major modification of our landscape, the forest structure, the densification of forests, um, and, and alteration of natural processes. Um, I put this up just it's important that we recognize what fire risk is versus hazard. This is the, 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 pers this is the perspectives we have on, on fire risk, and that is we're talking susceptibility of a resource, the intensity of the fire that impacts that resource, and then the probability that that event is going to occur. Right? That rounds out fire risk. Often we see over here these two together would be the hazard condition that's on the landscape without that probability piece. So this is a full perspective of risk. We often don't fully encapsulate risk, and sometimes we mix risk with hazard, because um, you can actually have you know, a highly susceptible resource with an extremely low probability, and that would be low risk to something happening, right? And vice versa, you can have high probability with low susceptibility, which would be akin to those restored forests in that natural regime, right? The trees would be resilient or resistant to death and we would be fine. That light come on? <laughs> All right. Oh, you, don't, don't, you don't want that. Um, so if we try to put this into practice, um, I think of wildfire risk. If we're trying to really pull out evidence and really encapsulate all of that risk profile and understand what different management regimes do, we really have this is the best we can probably get, was really trying to quantify it from a scientific perspective, all of those components, outside of a simulation modeling realm. And you would need all this, and it would really fill in these, these pieces. This gives you some estimates of the probability of fire occurrence, that is, an ignition, and then that potential for it to become large. And then over here would be that, of course, susceptibility piece or the, you know, the uh, susceptibility and intensity interaction is really observed in severity and severity maps. So that's often what we observe is the interaction of those two. Um, and then there's always a question as to whether that has some extant impact beyond just that local site, right? Does it contribute to increased severity to adjacent lands or not, and vice versa? Um, we're thinking in this mixed ownership landscape here. And it was a study that I really ended up embarking on a few years past. I think there's actually some copies up here around it. 
um, that we are looking at this issue. Right? What kind, what, what are the effects of these various management regimes today on wildfire hazard or wildfire risk? Um, here's a little piece. So this is just describing, this is kind of the area I was really looking at. Um, so you, you can recognize we're down here in the valley. Um, and then this is just a summary of sort of what's going on in that landscape with public versus private lands. Um, and so I, I looked at the ignition database that exists, I'm trying to understand how ignitions diversify across these management regimes. You know, one thing about the checkerboard landscape is it's sort of this really natural controlled study, if you will. It's just like, it's like these perfect little square blocks that are, they're not perfect in reality, but they're perfect for science, right? They're terrible in reality, but they're perfect for scientific studies because basically you have the same conditions represented by two different management regimes. So is, is the green here, those are all ignitions? Those are ignitions from 67 to 2015 in that region, yeah. If you live in one of the most fire prone landscapes in, in America, really, it's right here in Northern California. So it's, fire is a big deal here, it always has been. Um, I, I, you know, it's about 75 per year. These are, you know, human ignitions too. It's not just the natural lightning ignitions, but those lightning ignitions pose their own unique problems. Um, were, were they rising during that period of time? Or just no, it's pretty, yeah, it's been pretty level. I mean, in this period, you know, if you go back, I think human ignitions would decline pretty significantly. Uh, but as far as um, human ignitions and, and lightning, it's stayed relatively, it goes up and down every year, but it stayed relatively even, consistent. No trend. Not really a trend in this. Not in the ignitions. There's a trend in fire extent, like, yeah. not in the ignitions. I'm curious how you're defining ignitions. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's been established Yeah, yeah, because some years you don't. So this is the only Yep, this is only in this little region. So, you know, the four, you know, you get out here and count the opposites, you get up. <clears throat> Over here in the Cascades, you got a whole bunch more. And as those, you know, as the, the, the ignition patterns sort of come across on the north side of the Siskiyou's here, and we'll just hammer this right on up the Cascade Crest. Sometimes they stay south and hit Lakeview, but when they crest over, we get what we want, what we often see. And I'll show you an example of what happens in this here shortly. But this is the summary that we see for ignition data by those ownerships. Now we're talking about BLM land versus private land. Not all BLM land is unmanaged. A lot of it was LSR and the Roseburg side of things. Um, and then the, the private land obviously is, is largely managed. Um, we see on a per 10,000 hectare, 25,000 acre basis, right? So we're normalizing because they have different areas and extents. We see a lot more ignitions on the private land. But the distribution of what's causing that is different, right? So we see a lot more human ignitions on those private lands and we see a lot more of the lightning on the public lands. So they sort of separate, but there are more on, on private lands in this case. And it's not surprising, you know, lightning is gonna to go to the tallest things on the landscape, right? And often industry is not managing for the tallest things, they're, they're managing for money. Maybe the shortest thing sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, for good reasons. They're, you know, they're economically driven and, and people are building homes and other things. But, you know, that's another sort of an, a value statement there. But they, they don't manage for the tallest things. BLM harbors those. And then we have escape fires, though. So this changes the picture a little bit. More fires become large that's, that ignited on public land. Right, so this really complicates this idea of risk and how we think about it. So you may have more ignitions on the private lands, but there's a, a marginal increase in the number of large fires that come off of those BLM lands. What defines an escaped fire? The size here, and I'm sorry that they're in scientific numbers, but I started with um, 40 hectares, so that's what, 100 acres? Um, 300 acres and then about a thousand acres. Right. Yeah. And so that's what you see. So of course, there's less larger fires in this case. 
um, but they do come off public lands. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, and we can't really understand why. Um, it may just be how resources are allocated. Do they respond to one management ownership over another more rapidly? Do they just pin it on public lands for uh, financial purposes as you pay for that fire down the road? Or is this really representative of the difficulty of getting into a stand and actually suppressing that fire? Any of those are possible and we don't have those disentangled. And there's probably a combination of all of them. That's usually the case. It depends is a great answer from a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> It's the only answer, right? Yeah. And maybe in reality, it really is the only answer. So then we say, okay, now when you get those large fires, now what happens to the landscape? And we had this 2013 Douglas Complex fire that burned right through checkerboard landscape up on the Roseburg district, BLM district in this case. And you can see the distribution of ownerships here, right? That's that checkerboard, that sort of that perfect designed study that we all like to see because now you're that we scientists like to see because now you you know you're, you're really saying the landscape conditions are the same right the fire weather conditions are the same as they're impacting these landscapes it's not biased in any way in that case um, as these fires spread from essentially north to south or north to southwest um, is how they, they spread here and I'll show you some images of how they spread here in a second but this gives us then an opportunity to test, all right, when you have large fires under different management regimes, what are the consequences? Do you, is it positive to manage for timber intensively or is it negative from a fire severity perspective? Please. The people who manage in the forest are not necessarily the same organization that are fighting fires. Nope. These are ODF managed fires, right? So these, these two in particular. That's generally the case for any of the ONC lands is that they, that um, ODF contracts or BLM contracts with ODF to do that response. That's changed the last year or two and it's got a little bit messy. It still seems to be the case, but there's this chance where BLM would manage their own large fires, but not their IA. So it's mixed up a little bit more now. Uh, broadly? Only in the sense that you have an agency responsible for the response, but it's not actually responsible for the agency. Sure. But, yes. Which I don't, I don't know if that would drive any, any change in fire, but ODF is, especially in this case, DFPA is funded directly by industry to respond. And that is their purpose. Um, so they are, in essence, an extension of industry in that they're that wing, that suppression ring for industry, and then BLM buys into that too. But this allows this whole entire fire was managed the same by one agency. So it takes out this sort of issue of federal manages different than state or whatever, and this allows, again, for that ability to, to, to ask questions. Please. So the fire is up north right now. Yes. It started on private timberland, is mm -hmm. that correct? And it was small, and they didn't put it out, obviously. Um, and then it's burned into BLM land. I don't know mm -hmm. if I've got all my facts right, but who who decides right away what's managed by who and how many resources are put on it? Because you know, I'm sort of horrified <laughs> by the smoke and, and mm -hmm. whatever. And it's not that I think all fires are bad. Or that, oh, I, it's I a complicated issue. Right? Yeah. So, did this get away because there wasn't ODF? Anyway, who manages what? Okay. I think I get the gist of your question. <laughs> Sorry. I will say I do not know why it got away, but I will say that DFPA, Douglas Fire Protective Association, is responsible for the fire. And ODF now has a management team on said fire. 
DFPA responded to this fire. They are, they operate under what used to be called the 10 a.m. policy. They are, they are hitting fires as fast and as hard as they can because they are protecting a timber resource and that is their purpose. If you get on forest service land, then the forest service is responsible. If the ignition is on forest service land, when it then mixes with another ownership, say it goes into state land or goes into private land, it would become a unified command generally where you would share the command and the response between ODF in that case and, and the force service. BLM, I, I, we were talking about a little bit, changed their contract with ODF last year and into this year. And it's sort of, I'm not exactly sure, that, I don't know that anybody understands exactly how it's going to play out in the end, because you never really do when you enter into political sort of issues, but um, I, from what I understand, they now have the right to manage a large fire with their own team, but the initial response will still lie with Oregon Department of Forestry, and they will be as aggressive as any organization can be to try to stop the fire. Now, they didn't catch this fire, probably for a multitude of reasons climate change being one, the condition of the forest being another, and then that rugged, rugged, terrible ground that exists all through the Klamath Mountains here to operate on. All of those will be steep terrain. Steep, steep terrain. And so that just limits the ability to even respond effectively and suppress that fire. Um, most evidence says climate change is really, really exacerbating that opportunity. And these fires are just running and getting away. And yeah, we may be just stuck with it. I hate to say that. Let's take a look at, and this is sort of, this will give you a picture of what the operational environment is. And the operational environment is for this current fire is probably similar to what you're gonna see here. So this was <coughs> July 26, you can see. And just in this picture that I have here, there's 31 ignitions, all from that one storm. Right, and there are a whole bunch more out here. And somebody was saying that we get 300. Yes, that is common. Lightning comes, and then, then we have to respond. So the firefighters are then trying to respond to every single one of these ignitions as quickly as they can. And they often are not successful today. It used to be, and I'll talk about that a little bit, why they were. Primarily because of climate change. What are the black lines and the white lines there? I was hoping you guys would ignore those. Because <laughs> that, con that conversation is going to come up later. So, sorry. Well, not, not necessarily for this. I, so, these are major roads, and then the white lines would be connectors. These would be like little containers if you were trying to suppress a fire. And so, this helped lay out this idea, can we prep for large fires in advance to try to catch them when we want to catch them? So, this was an initial example. I'm still using it, so try to ignore those, and then we'll look at better examples of that concept that I just described in a minute as to how we may um, sort of deal with the fires of today, where we want them or don't want them. Right? So what I really want to show you is the spread of this fire um, from all of these ignitions that you can see here. And they were successful at suppressing some of them, um, but certainly not all of them. Now, the colors are severity, so red is high severity, Yellow is moderate. Blue is low severity fire coming off of this. So you'll watch a big old burnout down here. You can see it fill in as they were trying to capture that fire. Again, this is as aggressive as they can, and it was two 25,000 acre fires, right? This is doing everything they can to stop the fire as fast as they can. This is not any of these, this, this narrative that's out there that there's sort of lazy operators or lazy firefighters. This is just reality today. And this is just one example. Right, so again, since it was burning through that checkerboard landscape, we were able to ask, what happens? What's driving severity? How does management regime influence that, impact that? And this is a basic summary of that. Right, so this is all the lands combined. This BI, I wish I had a good pointer, but so the top metric is, is a, uh, fire weather slash sort of drought index mix. We call it the burning index. So it's how dry a lot of the fuels are 
at the time, and then how much wind is sort of behind that. And there was a lot of wind, and there was low humidities. This was east wind driving this fire. And so it rated out as the greatest contributor to fire severity, it's fire weather. It's almost always the case. Not always, but almost always the case. Fire weather drives it. But if we go down then, number two is the age of stand over here. Doing my best here. And then the number three driver is ownership. With private industrial force burning with greater severity than BLM unmanaged chock full of fuel force. The X-axis, what's MSE? This is mean squared air. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I actually, I actually yeah. understand that. So, so, so. Yeah, so this, yeah, this comes out of uh, a random forest analysis. Uh, it's easier just to think about the ratings, but what it's trying to say is if you, you know, sort of move through the distribution of the points that were for that value or that factor, how much does it change the error structure of the statistical analysis? So the more that it influences the structure of the air, the more important it is to predicting fire severity. All right, and you can see BLM still harbors age, and you can see most of these don't uh, contribute much, but when you get over on the private industrial, age drops out primarily because most of the age classes are young because of what they're managing. Right? So you don't have a huge distribution on their land base to diversify that factor, to make it a significant driver. But you can see it when you put them all together. So what that's just telling us is that there's two things. One, fire weather is really important, but as you manage for younger forests, they are more susceptible to death. Younger trees are. You get big, big trees out there, they got thick bark, they can really withstand fire. They can handle fire and be resistant and resilient to it. As you manage for younger trees, they're more susceptible. Okay, one. And then two, the fact that ownership still comes in, then there's something about how the distribution of the fuel structure is out there that exacerbates fire. And I would say, you know, here's an example of that distribution of that fuel structure. It's like grass that's 20 feet tall as a structure, you know, obviously it's different. That, that age factor that you just mentioned yep. is consistent, as I'm guessing, with the idea that plantations are fire traps, that the young plantations are the most likely to be. Yes, the most Maybe. likely to have their trees die in this case. We're measuring severity from a satellite, so we're really talking about death of vegetation. <coughs> that, you know, we're, I, you know, I can hypothesize about mm -hmm. other factors, but this is, that's really what we're measuring in this study. And then, so this is an example of fuel storage. And this came off of somebody that was operating on the fire. This is, so uh, I don't know who it was, and the, and the page is gone now. But this, it's a little hard to see, is one entire plantation, probably 10 year old, that has ignited completely all at once and created a fire storm, a fire whirl, or a fire tornado, right? So this is that even ubiquitous sort of fuel structure out there combusting all at once. Yes. Okay. Yes. The, you know, the, the species probably has the, the most limiting effect if you're talking about conifer versus conifer. Um, but the homogeneity of the fuel structure, and then you have that age where, you know, you're basically stacking fuel into a short profile that can just all combust at once. And that's, this is an example of that. I found it interesting in your slide before that slope was really low yeah. as far as So, yeah, this is severity, right? So we're talking about death of trees or vegetation, um, and the slope didn't contribute to that, but it likely contributed to their inability to stop the fire in this case. So two different things in, um, in that landscape. You know, there, there's, there's plenty of studies that show that there is some effect of slope when you're at least slope position, where if you're on top slopes, they tend to, to burn. Um, at higher severity as the fire gains energy and blows out. 
off the slopes versus down in the, the creek bottoms or sort. So there can be a slope effect, there just wasn't in this one. So this is just this, the results from this study, not others. And then it's that question of the contagion, right? So then we were talking about now, does this impact adjacent ownership? That, that's important to know, right? It's, if somebody's managing and they're putting you at greater risk, we would want to know that. Um, we're still working on this analysis, which I've been saying for years now. It's one of those things that's fell on the back burner, but I do have some pretty images that at least give us an, a sense of it. And these were created from LIDAR, so this is really high resolution information. Um, you can see the ownership here. This is from LIDAR. Now we're talking height of vegetation, which is correlated to age, particularly if you're managing it, but it's not a direct correlate. Um, but you can see, you know, the private lands, so very low, short statured vegetation, not surprising. Um, so blue is tall. Blue is tall. So you get down here on this BLM chunk and you can see fairly large trees. Large in height, likely large in diameter as well. Um, Did you say blue is? Blue is tall. Brown is short. Um, and this is the ownership, right? So private, industrial would be the red. Um, and then you can even see, you know, on the private land, there's this little chunk that looks like Oregon right there. <laughs> right? And you can see it right there. So then we're looking at a severity map. So blue is low severity, the red being higher severity. And you can begin to see the influence of the structure of the forest on the landscape in this severity pattern. And you can look, so the fire, one of the additions was up here and it's spreading this way. And you can begin to sort of look at what kind of contagion effect there is, or most of this would say that there isn't a lot in this case. Contagion of severity, not contagion of fire spreading somewhere. That still happens. This is contagion of severity. Now this is not a formal analysis, so we're still working on it. There are spots where it certainly blew out much more of the public land coming off that private land. And you can see examples of that, but we don't have a test on that. Cool. So this is the severity and susceptibility. Yeah. Are you now suggesting that severity and susceptibility are not No. Severity is susceptibility, and it's an integration of susceptibility and the intensity of the fire. We can only measure severity, in this case, from satellite because we can't be there measuring the intensity of the fire so we only see the outcomes but it's disingenuous to compare large trees that are fire resistant to really small trees and say well it's all you know driven by these other factors so you need to account for that biological factor that contributes to severity which is the susceptibility piece right so it's a component of severity as we can measure it split into those two. Susceptibility and intensity would be in a simulation modeling framework. You could disentangle those, but that's just modeling to, to, to try to capture that. So if you have a smaller tree, you can have a less intense fire and get a dead tree. If you have a big tree, the same intense fire it might survive, or you get a high intense fire. And so susceptibility is built into there because severity is just capturing its death. Oh, hey, John. Yeah. I was wondering, is there also the slash that's perhaps left behind after the logging out of the machines there? I mean, I don't know. We have some kind of data on that. But we don't have data on that. Right. Because um, we're looking post. I just went right over a slash. Yep. And some of that slash has been around for 10 years. Maybe longer, depending on what it is, yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, there was a great change sometime in the 80s or 90s from a lot of slash burning post-harvest to none. It sort of just fell off. And I mean, there's liability issues and problems with it. And there were nutrient issues and soil impacts. And there were a lot of reasons that drove it. But now there's a lot less of what they call site prep or burning of the slash. There was some evidence that came out of Washington that said if they did that, there was some uh, large plantations up in some fires that didn't hardly burn at all because they had site prep. 
And they actually, because they had site prepped, which is they burned all that slash off. And then if you come through with a pre-commercial thin, you would have to follow up. Or if you're, um, if you if shrubs grow and you, you know, kill those with herbicides or something, then that's more fuel and it's it's sort of this cycle. So there can be a regime where you try to clean all that up at an expense, at an ecological expense and an economic expense, uh, <coughs> concurrently. So in this case, you know, a lot of this was Roseburg. Some of this was Roseburg Forest products. Some of it was. Uh, Plum Creek at the time, warehouse are now, right? So, and really, Roseburg Forest Products tries to burn. They probably burn more than anyone else, but uh, it's still reduced in yeah, extent. So, it's a contributing factor. It's in there somewhere, you know, for sure. And here's just a, a picture of it. Post fire. Post fire. Right. So now they've salvaged, right? So they're restarting the plantations, but you can look across. And this would be that contagion piece, right? So you're adjacent to a plantation onto BLM land, and you can see some scorching into that other stand. Um, but then it sat, it did sit down, right? You can see too on the BLM land that the multi-story canopy of the trees are all different sizes in there. There's yeah. a lot of diversity in size yeah. plants. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And it's like your, green, your blue orange map showed it's as if somebody put the brakes on. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Some of those lines were pretty sharp. They're pretty stark. Yeah. I mean, that's when we looked at maps initially. That's what started this project. All of a sudden, we had square fires, and we're like, <laughs> <laughs> it's an oddity, right? Like, you don't really get square fires, but we had square, square, square looking fires. <laughs> yeah, it's an Oregon thing. <laughs> This is, you know, when, you, when you're talking about, oh, fire suppression effects and fuels and fuel accumulation, these are certainly chock full of fuel from fire suppression, right? But they're still doing better than this. It's a pretty interesting sort of dynamic. And, and certainly helps us think about how we can unravel some of the issues or where we need, who we need to work with and how we can begin to really reduce fire risk at a greater scale. Yeah. All right. You guys doing okay? <laughs> I got a lot more, <laughs> so start throwing things when you're done. When, you, when you're done. So, so I'm going to pivot a little bit now and, and try to say, so what can we do about it? Are there opportunities? Um, and, and how do we, we look at landscapes now and try to really unravel the fire risk that's prevalent, particularly down here? Um, I put this up. So this is initial attack success rate. Most suppression agencies try to meet a target of suppressing 98% of all fires. That's their goal. That's their gold standard. If you can do that, you're, you're meeting our expectations. And they have largely done it. They continue to do it. We're still hovering around 98%. This is across all, all agencies. This is a mix of everybody, right? There has been a decline, and you, you really see it. You know, there's a dip there, and it sort of hung on, and then it's starting to really unravel, right? This is Western United States. This okay. is a big area. We're outside of Oregon now. This is big, programmatic Western United States. And then the, the, the bar chart is acreage of fire, right? So you see this. We're still doing pretty good at initial attack, but we're seeing huge increases in acreage, right? So even that little marginal change maybe contributes to this or those that do escape that have always escaped are just exploding and getting bigger and that's more likely the case and we're sort of um, trying to deal with this outcome now right and a lot of it has to do with climate so i'll put this up um, this is average monthly temperatures in august so we're almost approaching this um, from 1895 to what i put 2012 Right, and I highlighted this little region here. Sorry, I'm trying to find a good place to be. All right, here, right? So this, you see this in dendroecology records, um, about 1949. 
all the way to about 1985, there was this cool and wet period that permeated the western United States, especially here. This is just for down here in the Rogue Basin area. This little marginal dip, so we have decreased temperatures in this blip where we had more moisture in the summer. And then we've come out of that, right? So now we have higher temperatures coming out of it and a decrease in our summer precipitation. This has really been shown to be a driver. Summer precipitation is a driver of large fire occurrence or area burned across the western United States. And this is an example from here. So here we enter suppression, right? This is 49, so you know, I had that picture of 53. We come out of the war, <coughs> and we have all the toys, and we're really going after it. But we are aided by Mother Nature. Really aided in the summer. You know, we started out this summer, has been pretty mellow, and we've been having these periodic, every two week, a little bit of cool temperatures, a little bit of rain, and sort of staved off fire. We have one up north now. Um, I don't know what the rest of the summer is going to show us, but we have those kind of summers. I've seen them. I've lived through them. I was a firefighter, and I didn't like them because I didn't make money. It's a different life. But I lived through them. Those, you know, those, those type of summers used to exist, and they're not very common. And we're certainly seeing a lot more fire. And we're losing our buffer from winter snowpacks. This is 2017. This is February 2017. Huge amounts of snowpack, right? A great winter. But really deep and hot summers. And it just erases that sort of buffer of that lagged melting of the snow that keeps fuel moistures, keeps the vegetation moistures up, um, was gone. It was wiped out. And of course, we had the Chetco Bar Fire down in this region that year. Um, and, and Portland experienced their first fire for most of those folks up there that same year, which was the Eagle Creek Fire. Lit by a human, but um, it was still a massive event for them despite having good winter snowpacks. And it's because we had such hot summers and we're now globally experiencing the hottest June and the hottest July that the globe has experienced. So these are sort of the, the reality that's setting in and we see it pretty significantly down here in Southwest Oregon relative, certainly on the west side to, to anywhere else. Now I was gonna show you a video of smoke, but we, we got it free outside, so. I'm not going to bother with that because the day that, you know, the Chetco Bar Fire really made its move and around August 20th, it really pushed some amazing smoke plumes out over the coast and over Highway 101. It's a really dramatic event when it blew up like that. But, it, you know, for six weeks it didn't do that. Cumulatively, we see just these, you know, as I was saying, the snowpacks can be high and we melt it off, right? We're starting to see much longer fire seasons. So our springs and our falls are lasting a little longer and our fire seasons are lasting a little longer. And this is based off of um, some fire weather indices. Um, some, other, you know, some other studies have showed it and they've used s some odd metrics, but this one is, is pretty good and it's really showing that we're rising in, in the western United States. And as we continue to put out all those fires on the fringe seasons, some of those fringe seasons are going on, we, in essence, are selecting for the worst ones only to impact our landscapes, right? That's, that's sort of a management choice in a way of, of interacting with fire is the only ones that are now burning all of that area are those 2% that escape, but those 2% escape because they're under the worst and hottest conditions in the summer. Rather than leveraging the good ones on the fringe season, we're actually exacerbating those worst ones. And that's a choice. That is a management choice that we are making and a cultural choice that we are making. Um, there's deep roots to it and a lot of challenges to unraveling that, but that is a fundamental choice that we make. We choose to suppress the fires. We don't choose to lose them as much as we maybe should. All right, so just keep that, you know, it's like I was saying, it's really human, like human, like our interaction with fire has a lot to do with what we are experiencing. Yes. So it's just like a controlled burn. Yes. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, you can thin and you can do things, but if you don't, even if you thin and you don't use fire, you don't gain really the benefits from that. You might save the localized resource, but fire can just blow through that. Um, so the only reason, the only way to stop fire is really with fire or through suppression actions. And of course we see losses to structures. We've all seen that and we've seen these, these nasty pictures of Paradise, California, um, which is a really sort of an anomalous event. I don't want to scare everybody like, you know, it's going to happen here. Um, it yeah, could, but... Weird, right? It's fine. It's actually a human dwelling fire, not a yeah. forest fire. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. I mean, this this fire lit at 6 a.m. and under 40, 50 mile an hour winds, and it just blew into town, and then it became the fuel fuel beds were homes, 18, almost 19,000 homes, in fact. Uh, we were close to here. We had to take it, but it's, yeah, it's remarkable. It is what burned and what didn't. Light is burned, and the tree is standing right in the yard. And yeah, there's a house gone, and there's a big healthy tree right now. We mm -hmm. would have thought it would be the other way around. A bizarre, bizarre case. Yeah, it really is. It's not the only. I don't see this. I, I like to show this because it's interesting. This is, you know. Um, back in 2016, Canada experienced a fire in May, the Fort McMurray fire, and they evacuated 88,000 people. Is that by the tar sand? Get a hold of anybody now. 88,000 people had to leave this. This is a global problem. This is not, you know, a California problem. This is a global problem. You know, a couple years ago, people were fleeing into the ocean in Greece, right? And this year, Spain was experiencing some of the largest fires they've ever experienced. In, I guess, in, at least in the recent recorded history, the Romans probably experienced one. Um, I had a graduate student that worked for me, and she was from Spain, and she said a, a, a large fire to them was 25 acres, and they just had a 15,000 acre fire last a couple, a few weeks ago, right? There's a lot of change in fire as part of that. And you can see, you know, in this case, it's the boreal forest in May. That's when their fire season really is. And this is what they were experiencing. They're so cordial, though. Does <laughs> <laughs> <Is> anybody? Actually, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> You know, they lost 2,500 homes. I don't, I don't think they lost any people or anything. You know, it, it turned out um, okay, given the situation, given that it was a million and a half acre fire. It's a huge fire. <laughs> so it's a little... It's, it's wild. I, I still love fire, you know. I don't like. I don't want to scare everybody from fire. You know, fire doesn't have to be this way, but it, is. it can be this way. Yeah. So it's. There's an old saying: "Fire can have your house burn down." Yeah. <laughs> it's very true. Did somebody say something about my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I love them too. One of them is somewhere running around. So this all. Whoa. <laughs> I didn't know it was still up there. I thought it was long gone. Yeah, that's Jasper and Phineas, my twins. Four and a half. I'm trying to regain my PowerPoint here. A lot of this, so this, this sort of, yeah, I put some of these sort of fearful images in there because it really does drive still this relationship, right, that we have with fire. So you see these really bad outcomes. Some of it contributed by us, and a lot of it maybe contributed by humans in the past uh, and present. 
But that just reinforces the need to suppress. The public certainly is driving that. Internal agency culture is driving that, right? We do not want to see a lot of these outcomes for good reason. We don't want to see communities burning down. We don't want to see watershed. We don't want Reader Reservoir in Ashland full of ash and mud. It's a real problem. We don't want to see that. And that just reinforces the suppression paradigm. But fire is really part of the answer of unraveling this and getting out of that and preventing that from happening. So we're stuck in this paradox, right? Fire can do really bad things, but fire is the solution. And so how do you balance that? How do we really come to grips with that and try to move forward so that we can prevent a lot of those from happening and allow fire to have its ecological role on the landscape? I put this up here as just a joke, of course. Part of this might be madness, but it's not all madness. <laughs> you get one laugh out of it. The big time. So this is just in contrast of not having this idea that suppression is all madness or allowing all fire to burn is madness, right? We gotta find balance somewhere in there. And we really need to do to move forward in some fashion that produces the best outcomes for our ecosystems, the best outcomes for the humans that live within it and rely on it. And we really are trying to. This is as a nation, my research program, we're trying to look for new ways to impart, learn to live with fire. This has become the national strategy that all agencies are pursuing. How do we learn to live with wildland fire? Some of that might just be adapting communities and setting up um, safe places for people to harbor when needed. Some of that is about adapting our ecosystem. Some of that is about fire management. And they recognize that. And this is that cohesive strategy. So this underlies now where the management agencies, cohesive being that it's not just the feds, it's the state, it's private entities and the sort. And they really want to establish resilient communities, safe and effective response, and resilient ecosystems, right? Great goals. I focus on this one. There's a lot of people that focus on this one, and a lot of people that focus on this one. This used to be my research, now I'm more in this piece. And so a lot of the perspectives now, which I would say is, is, has been left out of the conversation until recently, uh, to a greater degree than the others. And we really need to move all three forward. So you can adapt homes, look, you can have a fire that proximate to a very beautiful cabin, and the cabin can still stand. If the homeowners do what they are supposed to do. This really clean, really nice, beautiful home, a lot of fire resistant material. I mean, this is wood, right? So as long as you don't have a receptive fuel bed for those ash, those embers that are coming at you, your home can survive the fire. Man, and this is up in Montana. Really Pretty significant fire right adjacent to those homes. And so people do need to do their part, right? We need to move not only the individual homeowner, but whole communities <coughs> forward to do their part. It's not just a burden on the ecosystem to prevent this, it's a burden on, on all. You can do, of course, some forest restoration. This is really dry forest out east. Um, on the Malheur National Forest, and this is uh, their, their ecological restoration program, noting it still needs fire to really receive those benefits. Um, but they, they, could, they did reduce densities while maintaining some milling infrastructure in this case was part of it. Um, in other cases, that type of low severity fire is not natural part of the ecosystem. Something more like what we see coming out of the Kalmyopsis. So this is looking into the Kalmyopsis wilderness. So this is more local back in what, 1936. And you can look at the structure of that landscape. It's not these broad ubiquitous forests that we see, well, we don't see in there anymore, right? That, that wilderness has burned at a 10 year interval since 87 now, and essentially has reestablished its fire regime. And we're probably seeing conditions that are more akin to this. It's really something we staved off that it's just reclaimed itself to some degree. And here's another image looking into it. It's not that there's no forest, right? 
Washington or so, but there are many areas of non-force. Right? So is, is, what, is what I'm seeing there, um, or interpreting what you're saying, is that what was Douglas Square is becoming a Manzanita scrub? Well, this would be a Manzanita I'm scrub that became a Douglas fir, right now. Yeah, these are old, right? So this being the Manzanita Cenothus, yeah, right? But this is 1936, so this is pre. So what you're saying is it's going back to that now. It has. Yeah. If anybody's, anybody hiked out there recently? <laughs> Lots of beautiful flowers in the spring, I bet. And you know, the pollinators and everybody are having a really great time. It's probably a very beautiful landscape, but it's fundamentally different than what it had been for 50 years. But it's also backed, in, to some degree, has restored itself. Something we held off that largely is not. So, oh, I guess it just standalone slide. I wasn't sure it was coming after that, right? So now, th like I said, we're adapting fire management. That's where that's where a lot of my research, where research is now, is that communities need to do their work. The ecosystem can be adapted as well. Um, but so does fire management. Fire management needs to come to the table too and adapt and be prepared for the new reality that we're dealing with. And so I'm going to describe these tools. As long as everybody's got it in them. We're doing all right? I know this is long. Um, let me get you a short video that gives you a quick overview of this, and then we'll dive in a little <laughs> bit more and look at some maps and, and think about it together. Um, but it's we develop potential control line atlases. Uh, there's a quantitative risk assessment that's very prevalent, and then a suppression difficulty. These are really targeting fire management now. They can then benefit other programs within the agencies. Um, but again, we're after fire management. So this is going to be hard to hear. Have, uh, two minutes. Two. Welcome back to the Ponderosa Pine National Forest, where staff are working together with the Wildfire Risk Management Science Team to create more proactive wildfire risk management plans. One of the challenges of spatial fire planning is identifying control locations where operations can be safer and have a higher likelihood of success. This is especially important because control opportunities often don't align with ownership boundaries. With a plan in mind ahead of time, everyone involved can be clear on the best actions to take, even in a cross-boundary fire. The science team brings several tools to the table for this effort. The basic ingredients of these tools are intuitive and designed to complement local expertise and judgment. Quantitative wildfire risk assessments, suppression difficulty index, and potential control locations that help form potential wildfire operational delineations, also known as pods. The quantitative risk assessment uses fire modeling and expert analysis to estimate benefits and losses from fire. Suppression Difficulty Index provides an assessment of the potential hazards and opportunities for fire responders by balancing expected fire behavior with access and mobility. The Atlas of Potential Control Locations maps local conditions where fire lines have and have not been effective in the past and provides a measure of operational opportunities and challenges for suppression. By overlaying suppression difficulty and potential control locations on a map of quantitative wildfire risk, we develop pods that summarize risks to important values while highlighting opportunities to effectively engage fire. The science team is already deploying these tools in planning applications on national forest system lands across the western United States, including for real-time decision support on dozens of large fires. Incident management teams use these tools to prioritize responder safety and assess suppression opportunities on fire operations. And forest managers and their neighbors, like here on the Ponderosa, use these tools to integrate fire into landscape planning, prioritize fuel treatments, and create or improve control opportunities to reduce risk to things they value. Can the Wildfire Risk Management Science Team help with assessment and response planning in your area? Contact us to find out how we can help your forest and neighbors plan for the next fire.
There it is. We're done. Right? So that's an overview, and we can do a little bit deeper dive in. But yes, please. So this is like the other overlay that you started with, was public versus private lands. Yes. And then there was no discussion here about the roles of different stakeholders in actually getting involved in making show you some maps and we'll, we'll have those conversations because uh, it's, it's very true who should be at the table who needs to be at the table who harbors a lot of that risk and what are you protecting and I'll show you some maps from a lot from local here that really try to describe that because it does take partnerships remember we're under a cohesive strategy so the intent is that it does integrate everybody and we come to some semblance together all right so the pods, um, and we have hosted, I have hosted and worked with uh, the Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative to do this down here and across much of the state. Um, so this is happening and sort of uh, being, being populated around the state. Uh, and I'll show a map again of, of those areas. But in essence, what we're trying to do is think about the large fire before we have the large fire, right? It wasn't necessary to do that per se at least from a fire suppression standpoint, a couple decades ago, because they just put them all out. They were largely successful. We're in a different world now. We need to think about large fires before large fires happen. Maybe large fires that we want, maybe large fires that we don't. But let's think about them in advance and try to find places where we can let fire play its natural role and where we don't want it to and how we build out a strategy to deal with both of those situations. Because fire is necessary, fire is inevitable, and it is also often desired for the ecological role that it plays on the landscape. And this is a general process. Now we usually, we work with others to draw these. So this is me just making an example, but we come and we bring it to the local uh, collaborative groups or local forest service fire staff, and we let them really design this. We bring the tools and sort of a process, which you've just seen in that video. So a lot of this is driven and owned by local folks. Yeah, here's that potential control line map. This is what it looks like. There's Mount McLaughlin right there. This is Lake of the Woods, just for reference, right? So blue being a good control line. This is built off of recent large fire history, right? So we use a statistical analysis and the perimeters of large fires that are happened in this region to understand what fire managers use to control a fire. And then we can predict that across a landscape so that we can begin to see it in advance before the fire is there. Start to see also what fire managers are seeing. And we can look at the landscape. And so here's an example. So blue is a good control line a good location and the red would not be. And then of course you gotta somehow develop, if you're gonna contain a fire, a full perimeter of that fire. So you're really looking for polygons as we get to. So this just separates out the best of the top half, those with a probability 0.5 or greater. And it sort of started to form these natural polygons on the landscape, in this case, which I just digitized here, and overlaid on that risk assessment. All right, so now the risk assessment takes all the important values, in this case, 28 different values were spatially mapped, and then fire behavior models were run and simulated to understand how those values are impacted and the probability that they were gonna be impacted. We're back to that risk triangle that I showed early on. And that's what it's trying to capture. So you see here, when it's blue, fire has positive benefits to that ecosystem, or is expected to. Red, it's not, right? And you can see large swaths up here as you get into Sky Lakes Wilderness that it would have positive benefits, right? The values are such that it would be positive and not so much down here. And then we can summarize that and bend them into categories where we say fire is good here. And then the response should be commensurate with that. You get an ignition in there and you have assessed that it's positive for the forest, then your response should be that that fire is used to benefit the forest, right? That's the idea. You're flipping the decision from let's suppress, why wouldn't we, to let's not suppress, why would we? and then you justify why you take that action. 
when you're down here in a red one, you're going to suppress. It's going to be next to a community and otherwise. Well, what do you take into consideration? It's going to be a ground fire going from top to top until everything starts mm -hmm. to Yep, and so the, the simulation model pulls on historical weather streams, runs 10,000 iterations of a potential fire season for all these landscapes, and then you can begin to sum up the probability that you have the conditions that you see there, as well as the response of the resource to that. In some cases, that would actually create a, a good condition for some species in particular. Blackback woodpecker would be happy with a crown fire, post-crown fire environment, I should say. Right, so you know, it gets tricky. Not that that weighed into this risk assessment, um, but that's sort of the idea of what we're looking at. Please. When you say you can make the decision to suppress or not suppress, uh, where does containment come in? Would suppression be containment or would both be containment? So I'm talking about initial attack at that point. Okay. Do you suppress that and try to catch it small? Okay. You're not going to get all those, and then you got to look to opportunities if you don't want that fire where you're going to stop it and how you can stop it as best you can if you do want it then you're going to look for opportunities to how you can make that maybe larger to get the benefits of fire which there are significant benefits to ecosystems from fire so, so that you, you need to point about when during the fire year you're going to put your energy yes. into suppressing not suppressing to some degree this is really about a summarization of the likelihood across the fire season we're working on diversifying it by then the spring or fall conditions by the actual conditions so that we can further get to what you just elicited this would be more of even in today if you went out and you got an ignition up on Mount McLaughlin <laughs> it largely says particularly on this side fire is going to give you positive benefits not so much over here where you see the red right today even so high to fire season Absolutely. Yes. Yes, and we're working towards that and say iteration two, right? We're just trying to get the initial set out, which just gets fire season. And then we can start to say, all right, now let's separate seasonality and say, can we use fire for even more positive benefits that is going to prevent those really nasty ones that give us these bad conditions in the summer, bad breathing conditions and otherwise. Fire gets to play its role. Smoke tends to blow out much greater in spring and fall because we have more turbulent sort of air masses moving through than we do in the summer where we see the worst of the worst for air quality and otherwise. Joseph first. Yep. It escaped an initial attack. So we've done work along bridges and roads. Yep. Using a strategy, we know the firefighters now know where to put their energy for the safe places to suppress. Yep. So it works in the end of the It does, yes. And, but that, and I'll get to some of those conversations. Right now we're focused on fire management. It, it has these ancillary benefits towards fuels or fire break management or otherwise that we'll get into as well as when we start to look at multiple ownerships and mixed ownerships and i have some maps that'll that'll show that so absolutely um, because there will always be places where fire suppression is prudent and necessary and should be there communities easy example we're always going to want to protect communities and we're going to want to protect their watersheds um, but otherwise we want to find that place where fire can help us protect those communities and watersheds by having more fire. Mm -hmm. 
Climate change creates so much uncertainty, we do not know what the future presents from all of these values, right? Will they even be in that spatial location as one example? Will the fire behavior be similar to what we are simulating? There is a significant uncertainty about it. Um, we could throw our hands up in the air, I guess, or try. I think the greater point is we are already 20 years behind seeing these changes, already 20 years behind from visible and obvious changes. Like, I mean, when the biscuit fire happened, yeah. we've seen a continuation of that, right? And this is 2002 down here. There were signs even before that. So we're already behind. We got a lot of, we got a lot of catching up to do and, and, and hopefully we can, we can come to some balance. Now the long-term projections, I'm working with uh, Paul Hesberg on some projections of what the landscape would look like without suppression have ever started and then what we could look like under some of these kind of management regimes that's going to develop over the next couple of years that so we're going to try to start to go down those avenues i guess of research but it just takes so long to develop and so much time but you're absolutely right there's a lot of uncertainty and i take that as we're just behind we need to start moving forward much quicker much sooner and we're it's going to take fire really to get us there uh inconveniently in some cases we doing all right? I don't know if I'm in picture, but um, I know this is really long, so if anybody needs to leave, feel free, or if you guys want me to stop, I'll do that too. Here's an example from the Tonto National Forest. This is down in Southwest. This was implemented pre-season 2017, this process, pause, and this is what they drew up, their fire managers drew. Um, here's, these, here's the short definitions of what they are. Basically, in the red zones, there's a lot of values at risk, lots of communities in particular there. So they really want to respond aggressively, but now they have those, as Joseph was talking about, those smaller areas of where to go to contain that so that it doesn't get bigger. You know, they can at least maybe catch it at 1,000 instead of 10,000. Maybe we could have gotten the mile post 97 fire at 300 and now it's 6,000. You know, that's the idea, the hope that this could generate. Now we're at 6,000, can we stop it at 10 before it's 30? You know, if you start to think about it and plan for it, you might be able to do so. Um, so that's the red. The yellow is sort of a mixed zone, and under good, you know, under the right conditions, fire might be able to play a significant role and help you reduce that long-term risk. And then in green, fire is most likely to provide positive benefits, therefore your general response, at least your initial thought should be, we need to leverage that fire. You can, these aren't decisions, these aren't predetermined decisions, it's information that feeds the decision at the time, so then they can unravel that as necessary. And then they have these weird ones which are exclude, which is, this is a saguaro cactus landscape, fire's bad, never really played a role in those landscapes, they don't want it in there. They talk about prescribed fire and all of, even these red blocks, so they needed to create a separate category because they would not use prescribed fire in those landscapes especially with the invasive species that are impacting them. And then they have these, this weird one that they call high complexity. It's high complexity, I, I think, because of uranium in the soil. So bummer about fighting fires in that because you're combusting uranium. And there's a community down here, and there's no access and rugged terrain. And they just are like, it's just a problem. <laughs> this one was full of asbestos. This was a fire. This was the actual fire perimeter, and it was... A, full of asbestos, so old mining issues. And we have mercury issues north up here, up by Eugene, you know, in Coburg. They used to mine mercury out of that, and there's a lot of mercury in that soil that gets combusted. What is the HDRA sample? Highly valued resource and asset. So those are the values. Sorry, thank you for catching that. So that's how they distributed it. They ended up with three fires, you know, and three different colored pods, which was just like this bizarre thing. I don't know if they were trying to show off. But they, got, but they got them. And so this one in particular was a great success story because if you look at it, you know, it's this, this yellow pod where you could use fire, but surrounded by all of these really, you know, valued resources, basically. Right? So that's a source of risk to those. 
And you can reduce that source of risk with fire. And they got this opportunity to do so, and they essentially managed it from this point on out, leveraged fire, reduced risk to those surrounding, in this case, summarized into pods, but those surrounding communities and other valued resources um, by thinking about it in advance and taking advantage of the situation to leverage fire and get there. And they were successful at doing so. And now they've reduced risk at least for the next five, maybe 10 years. Well, it's probably reduced for longer than that, but they've really mitigated risk of that being a source to those communities. Um, and then you can see up here, you know, this, this one, this one ended up going out by weather, but uh, this one was in protect. They lost it. They didn't catch it right at an initial attack, but they did, as Joseph was alluding to, they were able to use that boundary because they had pre-identified it, thought about it, used it, and caught it as soon as they could to keep it as small as they could. Okay, so they were able to use these tools to take advantage of um, suppressing that fire as needed to protect those valuable resources. So it was successful down there, um, and we're starting to hopefully generate some success here. On my drive down here, I got the call to deliver these tools to the 90 mile post 97 fire. Of course, I was driving, so I couldn't until I got to my hotel, and then I sent them data, and now they're trying to integrate it on that fire to see if they can do something. We don't have the full pod, but they have the other tools now, and hopefully they'll integrate it and maybe have some success with it. Here's another fire progression map. Now we're overlaying the potential control line and the SDI. This would be how it could be used in a response. This was aggressive suppression. There's private timberland, but we're over by Summer Lake. Paisley, you know, the Mosquito Festival. Anybody go over there for that? <laughs> Hangs out right there. Um, so pretty remote, but they had this full suppression fire. They had, you know, they had timber resources, private timber resources. So they were going full suppression. Um, but you can just see how, it, how these align with their actions as this fire was progressing. See them using them for burnouts. Which most of these blue control lines are just roads. This isn't like, it's not really rocket science. These are roads that they're using and they're building off of. Um, you can see where they had this pretty weak line that they were trying to hold right here that cut across from a couple and it didn't, it wasn't successful and they had to bring their, their burnout a little bit further. <coughs> but ultimately, they end pretty successfully because we build these off of what fire managers use. They are still fairly predictive as to what they'll end up using to contain the fire. Doesn't mean it stops the fire, right? But it does give you some foreshadow of where you can actually grab it. And then you can allocate your resources to be more safe and effective with what they're doing. And that's safe and effective for expanding fire use and safe and effective for stopping fires you need it, right? So using, using fire as a restoration tool as well. Yeah. In many areas where they would identify it as allowed to burn, mm -hmm. no matter the severity, mm -hmm. as, a, as a restoration tool. Get yeah. that to restart. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's got trying to really leverage all this knowledge we've gained about fire ecology and see it put into practice because it has not been and i would contend that that's because of our fire management sort of in bureaucracy or organization that they're the linchpin that's sort of holding up that transition right we need them to come along too and they are ready for it i have lots of conversations with them there just needs to be some additional social and political will that backs them and supports them in their efforts there's a petition at the KS file table. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. I mean, what you're seeing is there's not really an incentive for them, right? Like, just fire. Yeah. Only risk. Yeah. Nobody gets an award because they let a fire go. <laughs> they only potentially lose their job. You know. Yep. Yeah. Or get hammered by the public yeah, and yeah, politicians. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Also, on the other side, I mean, I think the managers, the land managers, the, you know, the forest program could be built around this pod strategy where they're in the off season, they're bolstering those, those blue areas. I don't know. I mean, like, yep. are you finding there's a similar um, resistance to embracing this as, a, as the primary, you know, forest management strategy to make the blue <coughs> blue and Yeah. 
Right. Um, no, not from the federal agencies. Well, the, they, Forest the Forest Service is, yeah, the Forest Service seems to want this. And certainly the fire staff wants it. The resource specialists are waiting, I think we're, they're waiting to see the end result before we begin to have fully those conversations. Because in many respects, when we start this process, when we come to the agencies and we sit down with them, often that's the first time the resource specialists talk to the fire staff. They are in often separate buildings and just do not talk. They historically have not ever needed to or wanted to. This brings fire in as a resource, or firefighters as a resource specialist too, and puts them on level grounds to have some real conversations about fire. And so, so far there's a lot of positivity surrounding this, and a lot of hope to go exactly down the path that you're talking about. Seasonal staffing, increasing seasonal staffing, what does that It's not. <laughs> it's cultural change. It's always, always, it's not rocket science, and, and people know it and see it. And it's just getting that leverage and shifting over is really all this is. I, I, I'm, not a, 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 I'm not Einstein. I'm not some genius. I'm just, they, everybody looks at this, and it's just simple logic, and it makes sense. And it, it so far has, has, has been received really well. Now, as far as the resource specialist, there's a lot of staff that stays on the upper staff. The you know, as you get down to below engine captains and, and fire staff, they become seasonal. Um, and at best, they're going to see these tools and they'll see them on the fire line more and more, and they'll get exposed to it, but they don't get the opportunities to weigh in. Except for an example, like last week, the Willamette National Forest called me, and they're doing this process just to get familiar because they got a new FMO right in the middle of fire season, oddly, but he wanted to really understand from the fire staff and everybody what the Middle Fork Ranger District looked like. So this is Oak Ridge South towards Yumpqua. And this was a way for him to sit down with everybody, think about what the control opportunities were, look at some data, and get really ramped up really rapidly to that based on the seasonal staff being there. Um, so there is some issues, and I think the Forest Service could use a lot more staffing and a lot more funding to staff and, and be more productive. But the, the trends have been in the opposite direction for a while. Now. I thought they needed just needed folks with rakes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you showed one of your beginning slides, uh -huh. the, diff the cultural differences. Yeah. And where we're trying to go back to, in a way of speaking, is valuing fire as a resource and a tool. Yeah. Which is how the Native Americans used it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great effect and benefit. Yeah. Absolutely. So and and, and and doing that in a realistic perspective that is you can't just have wholesale fire to go crazy, right? Yeah. We we need to think about this deeply and understand and come together as a community to support those folks that are trying to do it. Please. Something I haven't already mentioned is that downstream effect, the health and economic impact of the smoke. Yep. Like what's affecting the Rogue Valley from the fire that's not even in this county. Right. That's got to play a factor in the public's concern about fire as a natural. Component. Yeah. It undoubtedly drives a lot of that perspective, perception. And, and I understand it as well. The, the, the problem is, is that we are obviously not going to stop fire. And the research is, is starting to develop and become pretty clear that if you do prescribed burning or shoulder season fires, those impacts are significantly reduced rather than the trajectory we're on. And, and so we're not gonna stop smoke. I don't see any future without that, but we can sort of minimize and get it out much quicker and minimize those impacts, and that's the hope. As well as hopefully adapt the communities so that um, those vulnerable populations are prepared, have the resources they need to ride those 
those unfortunate events out because that's necessary as well. Please. Is smoke travel um, one of the elements in those simulations? No. Always, a, I know. <laughs> <laughs> She invited me out to a smoke summit, and it's now it's like it's coming back at me. It's a, uh, it, it absolutely is not. I don't know that the modeling is there that we can, we can model sort of the production of smoke, but to know where it's going to end up and how long it's going to sit gets a little bit more challenging. Um, so it's not integrated yet, but it is a clear need and a clear direction. The problem with that of course would be down here that it would just be like well we need all of northern california and all of, all the way up to roseburg and then across to klamath falls to never have fire because all that smoke comes right here it does but not to the degree that causes significant health harms you know it's pretty high in the atmosphere when it comes but it does come from bc but the ones that really impact the communities are still pretty broad for this region um I don't, I, you know, we can put it in there, but it's just, it's going to be like, yeah, it's there, at least for this one. Um, but we hope to. I, I know it's a need, and you're absolutely right. And it, it is, and it is a significant impact on economies, on vulnerable populations, and it's something that we don't necessarily want to see. We're, we're not like, well, let's promote more smoke. <laughs> I want to promote the right kind, you know, better smoke in different seasons that gets out. That's, and that's maybe the only solution we have for this problem that I that I see that I, it, when I read what's going on in science. You say that we're about 20 years before. And so well, I'm wondering like, what kind of timeline do you see of catching up? Um, is it, are you actually seeing a possibility of catching up? And then the other part of that is what, where would you, you say the most valuable public focus would be in communities, in um, targeting the federal or state, or what, what do you see in that regard? That's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> you're, the, you're the big thinker. You should be up here. <laughs> so um, I say we're 20 years behind from the visual evidence. We're maybe 100 years from behind from doing the right thing. Would have been much more broken, right? We're 20, I, I say 20 years, like we started seeing these problems, we just like, put blinders on them for a while. And now it's in our face so much we can't blind it anymore. So we're behind, we're behind in that state. Right? Now, the, I think I would like to see the public focus on their communities, their homes, their communities, preparing their vulnerable populations, and adapting their economies to, to what's sort of coming. I think that's their need. And then support fire managers to begin to recognize that fire managers are providing a service. And this service isn't just about continuing to hurt the ecosystem through suppression. The service is diversified because of the complexity of the situation. And support them as they try to provide that service and recognize it as a service. I think the public really, really needs to get behind our management agencies. The poor forest service is thrown under the bus, break through the coals constantly. And there are reasons for that and, and justifiable reasons for that, but at some point we need to get behind them and say, you know, we support you. We aren't going to sue you because a fire did something bad when you made a good decision. Because those are gonna happen. Good, good decisions are gonna lead to bad outcomes. Bad decisions will give you good outcomes. And it's just the nature of, of humanity. And fire in particular. It's, it's, it's so much more. I was going to say there are mechanisms in the county and in the state to address pretty much everything that are brought in question. Mm -hmm. has to be the real lack is pulling the wheel and awareness and then a push on the label. Yeah. People in a position to be able to leverage that. Yeah. There are every 
single fire department when the fire department in Southern Oregon is on board with you made a reference to. There are <coughs> and basically our county commissioners endorse how they don't recognize it or not. That's another question. Uh, you know, so it's it's out there. Yeah. I mean the mechanisms are there. People are thinking about you're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And just <coughs> a lot more people and a lot more political will driving it and say this has to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. Please. So, just out of curiosity, are there any agencies that are pushing back kind of against this just because their history has been in suppression um, and not totally wanting to utilize this also from a public perspective so they can find full in suppression? Do you have one in mind? <laughs> <laughs> A loaded question. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing. Um, sort of, but not not really. So, Oregon Department of Forestry is at the table all the time, right? It's not, they are at the table when we're doing these pods, and we have conversations. Their fear is primarily that if you create a pod, that it becomes reality no matter what. So, if you have, a, they're going to always protect their lands. They're mandated to do that, and they probably should because they're protecting private lands and private resources. Now they think, so if you draw a polygon to do what we were talking about earlier, which is a fire blows up in their face, like mile post 97, that maybe you can catch it at 1,000 instead of letting it get to 10. <coughs> they're afraid that if you have that 1,000 acre polygon that becomes reality no matter what, they don't want that. They, they want to just maybe be able to stop it at 500. So, it's not a wholesale pushback, but it's they're, they're afraid of that potential outcome. So when I sent them data, it's an ODF fire today, we sent these two. We don't have the full pods, we sent these two. Now those just are assessing opportunities for them to catch it. They can create their own pod in C2 as they're trying to manage that fire uh, and get to some outcome. Hopefully they see it in advance and allocate their resources more effectively. Um, so they're not against it, and I'm on, I'm working with the Wild Governor's Wildfire Council, and this is going to be all part of that coming out of the governor's office. That this stuff will be integrated into the plan that's proposed to the state as to how we move forward. That will undoubtedly influence the Oregon Department of Forestry because they work for the governor, right? And so it's recognized as something of benefit to start thinking even in Oregon Department of Forestry, and they're on the mitigation committee as well. So it's not a wholesale pushback. They're just some concerns. They're, they're you know, and, and firefighters in general are a little bit concerned with data. They don't, they're not used to using data, and so it, um, it often is just foreign and just takes some time to integrate and understand and use because they focus on other things. I think one of, one of the entities that's going to be pushing back, and I'm casting my mind back to uh, the... Um, Commissioner's Forum on Smoke and Fire uh, several months ago, at which I made the point to the audience that we live in a Mediterranean climate and fire, the our forests are fire prone, fire adapted, and fire dependent, so fire is inevitable. And as I was walking away from the podium, one of the members of the audience uh, kindly and gen generously said to me, you effing bozo. <laughs> so I think the pushback is going to come from the public as soon as you start saying we have to learn to live with fire. Yeah. No, there's there's certainly people that always will. I agree that learning to live with fire is coming out of the nation, the nation and the states. That's not that's not me saying, you know, I I, I guess regurgitate that or, or relay that in, that message. Um, because it is reality, but that is the national and state strategies across the United States. So um, it's coming down from the top to them. Uh, so that it's, it's unavoidable. Despite there's always going to be critics and, and hopes for the past, you know, to come back, and the denial of climate change and all that. Like it's just about if we just did what we did in the '70s, we'd be great. Disregarding that climate has changed, you know. But that, that's always happening, but the momentum is moving away from them, and that's uh, that's just the way it's going to be. They're going to be critiques, 
Douglas County will critique this forever and hate it, um, but it's still going to be part of what they have to deal with and do because it's going to be right there for them to look at and have to, to integrate somehow. But, you know. What do you think of the wildfire maps that um, you can get off of the Oregon Explorer? Yeah. It's the same data as this. So, uh, the Oregon Explorer, there's an online resource where you can go and look at risk and get summaries for watersheds or certain areas. That's based off of a quantitative risk assessment. So you get these summaries like we're talking about doing here on different sort of areas of interest and understand what the resources are in there and the expectation of losses. So I, I, you know, I think it's pretty good. You just get these really long, long reports, you know, like 28 pages. Here's what you're dealing with. Right. Um, so it's a lot to... They, they have 10 or 12 different sets of maps. Yeah. Yeah. Including, including one that shows all the fire starts, which we didn't have to do a lot. Right. Uh, in, which in, was... In, yeah. In that, Shady Cove, I didn't keep jumping. Yeah. Which is that same condition data set I showed way early on in this. Okay, as well as trying to like create a one-stop shop for fire resources on our website, um, I put a little like QR code on the bottom of the uh, display board up here, but it's just kswild.org slash fire dash dashboard. And um, it has the, the Oregon Explorer map and a lot of different Facebook feeds from ODF or the Douglas Forest Protection Association that's fighting the Mile Post 97 fire. And, uh, a, the Rover Resist you, all sorts of different outlets for that communication and updates in one place. So if you're looking for up-to-date stuff or trying to make it easy for you, know, it's fine. It's great, bookmark it. So, speaking of KS Wild, Joseph was talking about, you know, reinforcing boundaries so you can catch fires, right? This is just an example of it. Where I looked at a jurisdictional boundary, again, this is, so this is, east of Ashland, um, looking up at the road boundary here. And if you look at it, you're like, well, this is a federal land. Like, there's going to be a lot of impetus to try to stop the fire on the federal side and not spread into private. But the opportunities <coughs> to do so are extremely limited. This, this rates the difficulty of operating on the landscape. So they're going to have troubles, and there are values at risk. So you can see these on these maps now and say, all right, Let's reinforce that boundary so we have some kind of protection to prevent losses to the private resources. We can plan that in advance and start to build a network across the landscape to get more fire or get less fire, to manage the both. As so we, are you we, saying that they would need to reinforce their forest boundary, the yeah. dotted line? I, I looked just on this image. This is just an example. This is not what was drawn, um, so don't. This was just me getting an example. Right. I pulled this up and I was like, well, where could we catch the fire? And that was the best I could, and it's not a very good spot, Clo as close to the jurisdictional boundary as possible. So yeah, you would have to ask the private landowners to say, Let's, what can we do? How do we work with you? How do we find money if you need it or whatever to begin to prevent more losses to your lands by reinforcing the boundary? So are you saying we enforcing the road boundary or the dotted line boundary? Not the dotted line because okay. it's not a good spot. You have to find a real containment. Okay. So it's the I, white piece that okay. I put up. I just want to make it clear that yeah. you had to build those that dotted oh, line. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where you, you're looking for that opportunity. And it may be on private, and it may be a mix of private and federal. You've got to look for those opportunities, work with your partners to develop that opportunity. So that's where I was going before. Yeah. Who gets involved in the line? Yep. And then also compensating. Yep. Well, you can't. It's, it's. I mean, you can insure your house, but you can't insure your timber. There's no insurance mechanism for timber. So, if it's a lot of wildlands, you can't just insure loss to fire or other disturbances to your wildland resources. There's just no mechanism. They don't do it. Insurance companies don't insure timber. When Douglas Ford, when when. Roseburg Forest Products loses timber, they lose it. They lose their money. There's no insurance. Put in place a regime where you're saying that it's actually beneficial uh -huh. to, to let that burn. It never will be on private land unless they want it. Well, yeah. That's because you're saying that. That's because you're saying that you can't compensate them for that loss. Put in place 
Oh. Is this in the conversation with Hamas? Then they could play that role, a positive role. Yeah. The whole regime. That's so exactly. that just that <coughs> there's no insurance policy right now that you yeah. couldn't be or shouldn't be. Right. No. So, yeah, that's a good point, and that is possible, and that's some that's higher up in the political system than I, 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 I reach, I guess. But you're absolutely right. There, there could be these, you know, just yeah, these, just like uh, depredation, for example. I guess would be a, an example where you could compensate people for a loss, particularly if you're trying to drive towards some ecosystem process. Maybe you can buy the land. Maybe you can buy the land from them. <laughs> but I will say. There is good neighbor authority that has been established across the nation. So if you were going to, say, do a fuels treatment there to reinforce that to protect life, <coughs> you can use federal money to work on private lands and state money to work on federal lands to create a closing. So there are some mechanisms for activities to happen to get, do this, but the compensation like you would if a wolf ate a cow or something is, is outside of the realm right now, but it could be. I mean, we have models of that on smaller scales. So it's a good point. It's a good idea. I don't know if the, we have enough money for the scale of the problem. Um, here's Ashland. Same example, you know, like Forest Service boundaries really close to town. And they've been doing a lot of good work up in the watershed. But you can see some hot spots like right here. So going up Tolman Creek and then this down here. It's a terrible place to catch a fire. Hard ground to work in, difficult access, and there are significant values at risk. So now you can see and start to work with these landowners and say, hey, you know, what can we do? How can we work collaboratively in a cohesive fashion to begin yeah. to protect the town to a greater extent? And I know actually that they already are, you know, with the city already is. And it's, it's, I think it's a single landowner, and so it's a little bit easier to try to um, help them out because it's a single landowner. But, uh, it's reflective of reality and what they are trying to deal with over national um, as one example. And then at a greater scale, this is now ending back in this really mixed ownership landscape here. Um, Grants Pass up in the corner, the shaded region is private land, private timberland. So you could see maybe where you would catch a fire or draw a pod, right? That pretty big region. This is a fire that escaped. You would never be managing a lot of fire in this condition. So the fire that escapes, like the Taylor Creek fire last year. Where you would catch it. Now, if you wanted to mitigate it, look at this really challenging ground to work on. If you wanted to protect all of these resources and protect the town, then you gotta ask yourself, what are the partners that need to come to the table and need to contribute to this? Which is the point we were driving at. And if you look at it, the majority of the landscape is not public lands, it is private lands. And that's where we really need think about how we, well, I guess rethink our expectations of what we can derive from certain landscapes in today's day, age, right? Is managing for timber efficient in this place? Is it worth the risk that's carried? Can we mitigate it enough by working on public lands so that we can manage the timber? How do we, we need to have those conversations and they're, and they're gonna be hard conversations but it's clear we need to have them in many portions of our landscape. That's that cohesive perspective. And I'm, you know, I don't wanna just pick on the timber industry, it's not my intent. This could be any type of land ownership where they need to come to the table. It just so happens the checkerboard turns out this way. And they obviously um, have fire issues, right? We're dealing with one right now. So they're not impervious to it, despite their perspectives. And so the, just some general concluding thoughts. Um, this being particularly important, that there's a shared responsibility that the public has for public lands, private lands, everybody needs to come together to figure out how we're gonna deal with this problem. And we think a lot of these tools can help at least with those conversations and help us start to at least begin to address the problems. And I guess I'm egregious with my kids, so uh, that's it. You're I'm entitled. That was long. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate it.
you coming down bet. here and sharing all that you're working on. I just want to do a quick sample poll of how y'all found out about this so I can continue to infiltrate the channel. Raise your hand if you got an email. If you didn't get an email and you want to get an email, sign the petition. Raise your hand if you saw it on Facebook. All right? Anyone who didn't raise their hand, want to just popcorn? Maybe a little type. Sign on the door. Yeah. Newspaper. Newspaper. Sign on the door. Yeah. Website. <laughs> cool. Thank you. The petition's there. Um, I'm going to get a blog post written that summarizes this. We've um, filmed it as well, and we'll be sending it out. Um, and I'll attach Chris's paper to that blog post as well. So you, I think we're out of the copies that we printed. Um, so you can follow up and learn some more as well. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.